And now, ladies and gentlemen, we will start with our next panel discussion. The topic of the discussion is building responsible credit behavior. So please join me to welcome on stage the moderator of this session, Mr. Devang Shah, Chief Risk Officer and Head of Decision Science, FPL Technologies. Welcome, sir. Now I would request our esteemed speakers for uh, to join us up on stage. So starting with Mr. Mohan Jairam, expert partner, Baines and Company. Mr. Supratim Chakrabarti, partner, corporate and commercial, privacy and data protection, white collar crimes, Khetan and Co. Mr. Gautam Sanyal, advisor, Analytics Risk Management. And Mr. Neeraj Dhawan, President and CEO, Geofinance. So, gentlemen, we'll be taking a few questions at the end of the session. And uh, moderator can take it from here. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for attending the event and really sorry for the bad voice. Uh, I think I must say, I mean, let's just to have a very, very quick round of introduction for the panel, right? Over here on this stage right now, we have almost collective experience of 100 years, right? Uh, going through, let's say, uh, you know, a retail boom in 2004, then the GFC crisis, consolidation followed after that, and then how different building blocks came in place to really... I'll say, uh, build a retail lending version 2.0 of India as such, right? So I think gentlemen over here have actually seen the waves uh, of the lending industry, as we say. Uh, so thanks for being part of the panel as such. Uh, the topic for today, right, uh, was selected after much deliberation, and clearly the idea was that if we look at, let's say, generation by generation, the lending has really changed a lot, right? For example, let's say, uh, our parents would have never taken a, any loan, right? Even for a home loan, they'll go to family, friends, and so on, right? Probably our generation, we started to taking a loan for home, auto, everything. And now when we see, right, that many of the food delivery apps, many of the ticketing apps, you get a loan for buying a movie tickets, and that is where you realize, okay, things are changing a lot, right? Consumer is changing a lot, and that is where we realize that this topic will make much more sense to hear from the experts saying that, how do we build a responsible credit behavior on the side of consumer as well as on the side of lender? So that is where the topic for today goes. Uh, Mohan, uh, starting with you, uh, you started your career in Europe with one of the finance company, came back to India, captive NBFC, a large private sector bank where actually you manage risk, analytics, securitization, everything, topped up with the bureau experience. The, my question to you will go, how you see, let's say, evolution of Indian consumer, especially in terms of the borrowing side? How, uh, you know, how, let's say, uh, borrowing shyness, how all these things have really changed over the last 15 years? How do you see that? And especially with your experience in other markets, do you see any specific similarity, any specific difference as compared to other markets? Thanks, Devang. Uh, and uh, thanks also for making us feel very young uh, at the right, right at the start. Um, so maybe picking this up in parts, and maybe it's a, it's a good thing to quickly dimensionalize the problem. Um, when we started off, uh, you know, many of us uh, looking at the sort of India journey on uh, um, consumer credit, uh, we would have in the 1.1 billion people that we had at that point in time, perhaps had about uh, 150 million people who had access to formal credit. That number has maybe gone up to close to about 500 million now. Um, so uh, we still are at about a 50% formal uh, credit inclusion uh, ratio. So I think the first dimension to think about is um, in India, there's almost like this pyramid, right? Uh, and there's a bunch of people at the bottom who don't have access to formal credit. They are borrowing, but they're borrowing possibly from their relatives, from the money lenders, and so on. And then there's this, uh, 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 you know, the, the layers of the pyramid, starting from the bottom, where people have access to some credit, uh, going right up to the top. So a couple of observations uh, on uh, your question. One is uh, I almost think that there are two or three different markets in play in India. There's a, a you know bottom of the pyramid where people are getting into the credit system, where what they need is to be educated on credit 
and uh, to look at what needs to happen in terms of their building credit behavior, building credit performance. Uh, there's a top of the pyramid, which is, I think, very equivalent to what you see in any developed country right now. The top uh, 50, 100 million uh, people in India are perhaps the same as, uh, you know, the, the, the same consumption pattern as you see in the developed world. Uh, and there's a the sort of middle, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, bracket of uh, people that you have access to. So a couple of observations. One is fundamentally as this credit inclusion goes up uh, from the pyramid, we will start going to uh, you know, the shape of a diamond, which is fundamentally there should be lesser people who are unincluded, and there should be more people who are coming into that middle bracket. And there will, of course, be the set of people at the top. I don't think for the people here, likely to be in the people uh, you know, who are uh, more at the top of the pyramid, there should be too much of a difference. I think the difference will be that we will become a little more conscious of credit we'll become a little more conscious of the fact that uh, the banking system, everybody will ask for uh, credit profiles a little more uh, in order to access credit. But for the bulk of the people who are in the middle, the, the diamond shape uh, and the, the middle of the diamond shape, I think it's going to be important for uh, them to get into the habit of looking at building a credit profile and uh, to see if they can actually start building uh, conscious and deliberate attempts at creating a credit history uh, as they go ahead. Contrast this to the developed world. I mean, what ends up happening after you get credit penetration and beyond is, uh, to an extent, the banking system starts depending on prior credit performance as a predictor of future. Today, for instance, when you don't have that, you basically use any other signal. But when you have it, you basically use that because that's the most predictive. And if you don't have a good credit history, that becomes a, a big stopper for you to be able to access credit and even to get into the consumption game. The last thing that I'll mention is uh, in the next few years, one of uh, you know, uh, my views, our views uh, as, as a uh, firm, for instance, is consumption credit is likely to be one of the bigger drivers within the country. And if that's the case, uh, there's going to be a lot more that will happen in that, that uh, you know, the middle of the, uh, uh, the income bracket that we called out. And that's going to require people to build that credit profile and also to protect, protect it uh, and to uh, you know, be deliberate, like I said in uh, looking at their credit history growing over a period of time. So uh, I think that's the easiest way to contrast it. Uh, a country in different uh, you know, places, the top performing differently from the middle, Absolutely. the shape changing, and the increasing importance of consumer credit, if that makes sense. Uh, thanks, Mohan. Uh, Neeraj, a question for you, and a very, very quick uh, introduction for Neeraj. Right? He's the person who I've actually built, uh, and literally built credit risk policy collection function of India's two large private sector banks, and now on his way of building uh, probably one of the largest uh, NBFs in India, uh, right? A question to you more from the lender side, right? I think Mohan touched upon the consumer side. Now from the lender side, what are the considerations which uh, one should have, right, uh, for building this responsible credit behavior as such, right? I mean, and I'll say uh, not just from the credit process perspective, but I'm sure there are various so society-induced factors also, which somebody has to keep in mind, right, while building their policies, processes, I mean, just a practices kind of thing. Uh, any views on that? Hello. Uh, good morning to all, and thanks, Devang, uh, for a fantastic uh, capsule of introduction as well. <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll break this whole thought in maybe, you know, phases. You know, credit has evolved in the country in, in my mind in, say, four phases, which has also led to changing dimensions in terms of how credit information usage and policy framework has evolved. So let us take uh, pre-2008, before you know, the financial crisis happened, credit was done in a very uh, you know, rudimentary manner, if I can use a word like that. Uh, and done in a process saying that you give the document and come back after a couple of weeks and then you will be aware of what you are going to get, right? Jumpstart into 2009 and then you realize that credit is very, very important. So we need to bring credit and then that whole evolution of credit framework policy got evolved and that took a good eight years, 10 years to reach to a size where different institutions created you know, credit appetite, framework, policy, guardrails to work on that. And then comes 2016-17 with demonetization, GST, and, you know, various guardrails which the government introduces into the whole ecosystem and whole dimension changes. And, you know, you've got new age lenders coming in, fintechs uh, and capabilities are getting built up. 
and there you know the whole lending is going through an assumption phase saying that can i do with information and a uh, highly misused word is you know ai ml and data analytics and things like that and that got used in uh, you know different shapes and sizes in terms of assumptions and that led to customer experience expectation at a very high level but delivery and for us we are a lender so for us it's not a fmcg product for us the product is where i need to sell something and get with the principal interest back so that full closure of the journey becomes very very critical right so this phase went into that and then comes uh, covid in 2020 and uh, suddenly the whole paradigm changed to say can i do the same thing in in a very digital format the whole ecosystem societal uh, requirement changed so everything became uh, you know paperless cashless uh, you know digital uh, no interface no touch point right and that has got done very well for at least the lending community because we were always working in a archaic thought saying that you know unless i touch and feel the paper i will not take a credit call right suddenly the paradigm is that i don't have a customer with me i cannot reach out to him right i need to do my business <coughs> so can i take a call based on data information ocr converted into data and so on and so forth right the whole evolution has changed so the whole credit format has changed today so that is where we are heading into and that's the uh, you know the opportunity from a lender perspective that you know you got so many uh, lenders fintechs players coming into the uh, arena to say that how do we cater to uh, the customer segment and customer is becoming important and we have really you know they are also india's a growth story as such right so everybody wants to get into uh, you know consumption pattern and because you know digital is important so whether it is card businesses whether it is uh you know account and line of credit and things like that and the latest one which has come a couple of days back that upi on uh, credit has come in so the whole ecosystem is changing and evolving credit is becoming very very uh, easy as well as challenging because how the lenders are going to use this to their advantage can go and cross the line of uh, governance guardrail which is where the challenge is there today and governance is catching up on that so we need to have a balance because the purpose for which we are lending is one financial inclusion to my mind right second that top of the funnel which he spoke about there are too much of people after that we are not catering too much in the middle and the lower segment lower segment i don't think so people are thinking too much but if you do go through the journey of the life cycle of the customer whether it is a behavioral pattern uh, his consumption pattern his footprints on various things and of course the collection behavior if you consolidate that it will help us to build a uh, credit uh, framework for customer who has touch point uh, and incidentally only one third of the population or around that is uh, on the bureau right rest is still not so which we call as ntc how do we build ntc uh, you know algos so this is the learning which we need to capitalize and work on so that's the journey i think and uh, credit has really taken a uh, you know exponential giant leap over last Uh, a decade or so and the speed at which we are growing in last 3 years and the speed at which we will grow in next 18 months or so as a as a change it will be changed it will be dimensionally changing differently i think uh, that's great in the neeraj we have that right and i think what you have actually you know touched upon uh, the question i'm saying that practically data is now really become a new oil for us right uh, we have with us supratim supratim is a partner with khatan and company and out of the very few uh, people who have been actually you know spend more than a decade i mean right, the last 15 years he has been uh, spending on let's say uh, data protection uh, one of the very very big contributor to the pdp bill which has uh, uh, come to india uh, suradeep first of all congratulations for being part of 40 under 40 thank you uh, so my question to you i'm just continuing the theme what neeraj touched upon right i think consumer consented data right now this is going to become more and more important in the life of consumer in the life of lenders right i mean today uh, there may be let's say a data footprint which we may be living everywhere kind of thing but with pdp bill coming in consumer consent is becoming a really important thing so it would be really nice to hear 
your journey on this, uh, the data protection side, how do you see consumer consent and so on? Right, I think, thank you. I think uh, I am the odd one out in this panel. I'm the lawyer, so uh, I will take a little more time maybe than the others. But uh, first, let me talk a little bit about the journey, okay? It took, took us about six years to make this law. And uh, at one point in time, when we used to speak to foreign lawyers, law firms, etc., you know, they started almost making a joke that you have come up with another bill. Uh, but thankfully, when it went uh, towards the end, you saw in August, it went really fast, okay? Uh, let me talk about our journey. So Justice Sri Krishna Committee was formed in July, August 2017, and he went across India to have several consultation meets, okay? And I was fortunate to be part of, you know, almost most of those uh, consultation meets. And we heard people who were speaking different dialects or, you know, people from the illiterate population, etc. And we could understand that consent is broken, okay? Because people were not understanding what they're consenting for. People were speaking different languages, uh, illiterate population, even the most educated people are not reading what they are uh, consenting to. We are just pressing I accept and I agree. So there were ideas which were thrown, okay? And I remember especially the Bangalore and the Hyderabad session where a lot of tech guys were there and they were throwing amazing, uh, uh, you know, ideas which could be utilized. And uh, we picked up one of them, which was the uh, consent manager. And uh, we said that, okay, in a very crude form, let, let us think about it. What if we had a service provider of sorts to whom I can give, again, crudely speaking, a power of attorney. That, listen, I am okay to give consent for ABC, but I'm not okay to give consent for XYZ. And if, what if that consent manager then takes care of this consent process going ahead, right? So this was one of the things. There are other smaller pieces which this particular law tries to take care of. Um, and that is, um, you know, having this availability of the notice and consent in all the 22 languages of, uh, of in, uh, that are there in the Constitution of India. Uh, it's a little onerous, but I think uh, that option has to be given to the data subject or the individual uh, to access such notice and consent in different languages. I think it's a good step, uh, a step forward from you know, the, the problem, considering the problems that we are observing when we were doing these consultation meets. Before I give by, back the mic, let me also touch upon one interesting anecdotal story. Okay? Uh, Justice Sri Krishna was drafting this law and uh, we asked him that, sir, life is anyways quite difficult for lawyers and you are naming data controllers as data fiduciaries and naming data subjects as data principles. Okay, everywhere we'll have to explain to foreign folks, etc., that this is different, this is the real meaning, uh, the correlative meaning in our jurisdiction, etc. So he said, Shuprati, after the Britishers have gone, I would not like to call any of my fellow Indians as subjects. Uh, that's the reason I'll call them uh, data principles and the data controller as data fiduciary. But there's an underlying legal, deep legal meaning to that. That is, is there's a relationship of trust. It is not transactional. It's not that I've just simply given you data. It's the individual who has given the data to someone in trust. And that is how it should be handled at the other end, number one. The other thing that you, if you look at the Digital Personal Data Protection Act, it works both ways. There are some duties for individuals also. They have been told that if you are giving fake, false information, having false, uh, frivolous litigation uh, allegations, etc., then a penalty of rupees ten thousand, up to rupees ten thousand, can be slapped on that person also. So it works both ways. I think we are trying to do a balancing act here. Whilst it is very important to protect personal data. But it has been made clear that, you know, innovation, entrepreneurship, business should also not suffer. I think that is how we have set sailing. Let's see where it goes. No, uh, thanks, Pradeem, and thanks for giving us a perspective of what went uh, behind the scenes kind of thing. Thanks for that. Godam, having touched upon data, now the favorite subject of analytics, right? Uh, you have clearly seen, let's say, the evolution of data, evolution of analytics on the banking side, on the lending side. I mean started from, let's say, probably a boarding pass surrogate to a today like a 100% uh, digitized processes on underwriting, lending. How do you see analytics playing a role uh, to build a responsible credit behavior as such, right? I think analytics has got a fundamental responsibility now, now that the lots of data is available. How are you going to ensure that there is a responsible credit behavior? And especially it would be great if you can touch upon the point of leverage Right, which I'm sure uh, many of my fellow colleagues would be uh, interested in knowing your views. Uh, thanks, Devang, for the uh, kind introduction. 
So, uh, two parts to your question. One is uh, about use of analytics and coupled with its responsible lending. So, first a bit on analytics, uh, then on responsible lending, and within the responsible lending, maybe touch, I'll touch upon leverage. So, analytics has uh, got a new, uh, whole new, what should I say, attention due to the introduction first of the word data science and now AIML. So, everybody talks about AIML. I think uh, we would do a, a great favor to all of us if we spend some time technically to understand what actually AI ML means and how it is different from a traditional statistical modeling that we used to use. Because all of us uses that, probably we need to spend some time, at least senior people, to appreciate. Uh, having said that, uh, still, uh, I believe, apart from the very evolved modeling and the AI ML we are talking about, the basic data and the rigor and the rigor of execution I think these are the few things we still need to focus on as a country and industry. Uh, I was very pleasantly surprised uh, yesterday when I was looking at one of the consult consultation paper by OSFI, the Canadian regulator. They have formed a body of professionals to discuss this, in which they have emphasized this point. Uh, I'll give you an example. I know a fairly wealthy gentleman who uh, regularly receives uh, offers of personal loan from two banks still in India. So one is for about a couple of lakhs and one is for th two, three lakhs. One of them I can dismiss is coming as mailer, so maybe not a pre-approved offer from uh, the bank itself, but the other one actually pops up on the mobile banking. And the gentleman will never take a one lakh, two lakh, three lakh uh, loan. And for, incidentally, the liability accounts of the gentlemen are both with both the banks. And they can see possibly that uh, multiple of, so how, if you use what kind of advanced analytics is used, uh, I'm not touched upon the responsible lending. I'm just focusing on that analytics apart from the sophisticated modeling, the rigor of implementation and execution and use of correct data is extremely important. We need to focus on that. Second is responsible when it comes to respond, responsible lending. Mohan talked about the consumer side, which of course we can tell them consumers to be responsible, uh, they should not take much leverage, etc. build the credit behavior. But there is a lot of responsibility from the lender side. If lenders do not behave responsibly, it's my strong belief that uh, the culture of a responsible behavior is not inculcated into the uh, consumers. So, uh, at the cost of exaggeration, I often use uh, from the corporate lending world a very uh, stark example or a scenario, it's hypothetical. I often used to say that in a corporate lending, if you lend to corporates who do not deserve that credit, during a confidence of, uh, crisis of confidence, these corporates will be the first entities to move their money from your bank account. Because they know if this guy mere ko paisa diya hai, to itna kitra bahut jagah pe lend kiya hoga, so I should be worried about it. So be, please be responsible as a lender. So I talked about low-sized uh, offers, which is not suitable for this gentleman. Now turn it around and look at what is responsible lending. Giving, using analytics, offer the customer the right product and the right sized limits. It could be for credit cards, it could be for any other. So if you give an outsized offer, it, it really destroys the culture. And somebody told me, one European gentleman told me that, you know, when you innovate in credit, it finally settles down to the lowest common denominator for the whole industry. It doesn't take much actually to compete in credit innovation. You dilute your credit policy, your competitor will go to his boss, will have a couple of meetings, will go to the committee. It's a matter of seven, ten days to approve that policy on paper. These days it has become a little difficult because you have to write the BRE also, the business rule engine. <laughs> Previously, it was a matter of days. Oh, you are touching the real code. <laughs> yeah, I know because 
the ability to execute is limited uh, still within many entities. So uh, it has become a little difficult, but uh, it was like few, few days or hours even in the past. It is now a month. So this is responsible lending when you give the right size limit. If you give the wrong, I can, I'll quote you from uh, my personal experience, found out segments where it was a high loss rate, investigated, found out the customer selection was perfect. So how do you see? You see it in the phenomenon playing out. The count default rate is low and the loss rate in terms of amounts is very high. So you selected the right customers, but who defaulted, defaulted with a very large limit. Everybody doesn't have control. So this is responsible. And leverage is one example of leverage is this. It is extremely important. I believe that uh, these days, analytics, while has facilitated the whole journey for the customers, also in many cases, we do not have a good hang of the income of the person we are lending to. And that is where the leverage has got a lot of uncertainty. Analytics should be used to pinpoint or maybe not pinpoint is not the right word, but to measure the leverage as accurately as possible. Use a lot of data and analytics there. And unsecured leverage probably one should be a little more conscious about which the industry is not. Absolutely, yes. I just want to add thought here, you know. From a you know, behavioral cross line, right? He spoke about leverage. Leverage can be debated in the uh, system from a perspective that what is the risk appetite for my institution and what's my ROI in that particular product can change the leverage differentiation from one lender to another lender, yeah. right? It is very important to understand this fact that leverage is going to spoil the credit behavior. So the customer will come into the default queue and may cross line where he becomes an NPA across the board and so on and so forth. That will impair his uh, you know, uh, credit history, but it will spoil my uh, portfolio, right? And we have seen in, you know, r multiple cycles that, uh, you know, we are very good in the front end uh, offering the loans and we do not have the intelligence and the, uh, you know, framework on the collection side to predict uh, losses, to predict delinquency, and then you don't know how to handle it. So it's a, you know, leverage is always at the front end, right? Whereas the whole life cycle management and collection is very, very key. So leverage can be defined today and argued saying that, you know, I have a risk appetite, my PNL on Excel looks super, but Excel is fine. But as I said, that in multiple rounds of, uh, you know, ups and downs, uh, you know, everybody is fine if it is going up. The moment the market sees troughs, you have challenges. I think uh, what you both of you collectively said, I think product risk translating to customer risk and then touching the entire industry, uh, I think that's a great point. Uh, just continuing the question, uh, right, I'll say self-employed segment, right, I think definitely, I mean, I'll say India's growth will depend on how the self-employed segment is going to grow. Uh, giving a credit to them is going to be super important as such, right? But this segment has got its own challenges in terms of unstructured data, business seasonality, and so on, right? How do you suggest, let's say, as a fintech, right, how can we actually help the self-employed segment to build, to make them aware about this responsible credit behavior? Any views on that? Yeah, yeah. I, I love this segment a lot. Uh, you know, because everybody goes behind the consumer segment, right? So today, the consumer segment has got evolved at a particular level. Uh, whereas the attention on the MSME is, uh, or I would say more on the micro side, is little limited. The reason is that you know today in a formal structure, there are about 70, 75 million of these individuals who have some resemblance of uh, touch point between uh, you know MCA and a GST and a uh, Udyam and uh, other registration. And outside this, you will have maybe similar amount of customers who are doing some sort of business, but not in any form of a recognition. So let's leave that outside. The 75 million of, uh, you know, entrepreneurs, if, if I use that word, right, of their a formal uh, information in the structure is less than 30%. It's close to 25% would be there on the bureau. That means that is only the what is there on the formal structure. Rest is not even there in the formal structure. So from an opportunity perspective, this is the next boom to my mind in terms of how this will, you know, grow and blow. The challenge here, which you touched upon, is that, you know, 
you know the the seasonality of the uh, model uh, the uh, transparency in the crispiness in terms of the accuracy of information being shared and so on and so forth makes it very very difficult uh, to evaluate credit but credit uh, i would say that here is where the fintech and others are going to get into the innovation part of it saying that you know can we create newer products offering which can be user friendly as well as ease of evaluation and ease of repayment right the traditional products of line of credit and term loan and so and so structured finance may not be applicable to the larger portion of this whole pyramid right yeah. so that is where the innovation will happen and that is where the whole opportunity lies and today with the information data with the consent framework and aggregation of the government uh, initiated uh, you know make in india and startup and so on and so forth plus the guardrails you know other stack uh, your you know various information account aggregator framework wins ondc and so on and so forth which are all helping us to create that ecosystem to say can i leverage on this knowledge which is available with all the governance around it in terms of uh, you know consented data and then convert that into meaningful outcome and deliver to it i am just wanting to do this over next you know some period of time to say how can we create a credit enablement in this you know i'm saying 75% or 70% are not financial included in that you know formal sense True. it's a huge opportunity and we should work on that and don't worry about the seasonality part of it you will create products to cater to those things as well but first getting them into the net is the the key important part uh, so to the question to you uh, the pdp bill actually talks about various rights to consumers uh, rights for correction rights to be forgotten etc how do you see this rights going to help uh, building this responsible behavior right i think a uh, good question uh, if you see uh, many a times you would have things recorded against your name which may not yeah. be correct and today there is no formal avenue for you to approach an organization and say that listen i want to sort of get this corrected or erased or things like that so there was always this thought process that how do we bring this in and out of like it is there in several global uh, you know uh, laws uh, such as gdpr etc uh, we thought of taking some of the good elements from there and you know getting this into our law so yes there is this right that you have and this is both inward looking and outward looking okay uh, whichever uh, person you are taking the personal data from it can be your employees it can be your customers okay they can come knocking at your door and say listen i want to understand what data do you have about me i want to erase the data i want to correct the data i think this to my mind will also bring about a balancing factor and things which were otherwise non rectifiable at least the individual has that empowerment today to you know go and and ask organizations to get that uh, undone perfect uh, gautam a question to you uh, i think today lots of uh, efforts either from the lender side from the consumer side are being spent let's say at the time of origination at the time of taking a loan kind of thing right but i think it's very much important especially from the consumer side to keep looking at his i mean let's say monitoring his credit health monitoring uh, the behavior kind of thing throughout the life cycle uh, can you help on that i mean how do you as a consumers right we should take care of our credit health yeah absolutely i think uh, there is a lack of uh, consciousness uh, i think within the very evolved class what mohan was describing or neeraj was describing maybe in people in this room are aware but a uh, lot more awareness is required uh, uh, in order to monitor uh, the regular credit report and credit reports are available also free from uh, many of the banking sites or lender side and uh, uh, this actually helps consumers abroad people are conscious about it because you don't get any any lines unless you build uh, at least with a credit card or some kind of line it is critically important and uh, again coming back to your leverage one should keep in mind that i should not leverage myself beyond a point or so little bit of education and little bit of self restraint in terms of how much i should borrow i mean that would uh, go a long way into building a good credit history and of course support the consumer in the journey uh, so continuing a the theme of credit monitoring uh, one question to you 
do you see a possibility of uh, you know building a business model around the area of credit monitoring credit awareness i'm sure many of colleagues from the fintech fraternity would be more than happy to know about it yeah sure i i actually uh, you know i've always believed uh, you know for example to start with financial inclusion is good business <laughs> i mean if you are able to find a good responsible way of doing it it, it is great business uh, and i think uh, you know analytics together with what uh, you know uh, um, gautam uh, spoke about uh, a few things neeraj spoke about the fact that there's been a bit of a, a continuum there so let's actually split this into the different players right? let's talk about you know for example is it good business for uh, fintech there's a problem to be solved in terms of lending i mean how do you lend how do you lend right uh, and uh, i i think uh, you know to a great extent the the fintech community Uh, and and banks are actually learning from the the community as well as as things are going ahead uh, are setting the the tone for what needs to be done uh, in order to get that mix right so uh, you know what for example are the right uh, uh, you know ways to underwrite a customer what are the best ways to think about leverage what are the best ways to uh, you know in uh, uh, build scores what are the best ways to monitor uh, consumers i think there's a there's a model of operation Uh, that by itself naturally lends to good business practices uh, and i think that's a sort of lending monetization should i put it that way of credit uh, uh, inclusion uh, coming to the specific direct question of credit education uh, consumer credit education and figuring out if there's anything that you can uh, do to monetize it i think that's again a big opportunity in the fact that uh, again uh, you know maybe back to a, uh, a couple of points that were made between uh, neeraj and gautam i think as the the market gets more mature uh you know i think it's a uh, it's a good uh, way to call it out right your exception making comes down uh when you have rules exception making comes down when you have uh, score cards exception exception making comes down so which means people will have to be a little more conscious of what they are doing a mass of the audience that are getting into the financial system these days don't know about this so there is value in giving them that insight and by the way the quid pro quo could be that they will uh, you know treat you as the fiduciary right i mean effectively Uh, and that might be the best way to build a model if they trust you and you do the right thing by them uh, they are not going to just buy one financial product they are going to continuously buy other financial products and by the way lending is not the only thing uh, india has an opportunity in insurance it has an opportunity in payments so there are multiple products that they need to pick up so there is uh, on both ends i mean on pure lending in inclusion there is a logic to the fact that you can actually make it work uh, if you are able to find the right model uh, and i think that's a big part of what i think Fin, fin, the fintech needs to solve for and by the way credit education similarly this is a the, the, there's a big problem to solve in educating people the right way to get them to the place where they can actually uh, uh, trust you uh, and you can uh, then leverage that trust to do the right thing by them but you know earn along the way there is nothing uh, that stops you from doing anything there perfect uh, i think with this uh, i would like to uh, uh, thank all the panelists all right for sharing your views i mean a very very frank views very very uh, rich experience which you have shared with all of us thank you very much for that thank you